How is it? Hi. Hello, Patrick. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, hello. Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, good. Uh, and then, Andrew, uh, can you share, try to share the screen and then I, uh, we can see whether uh, this is functional uh, well. All right. Uh, just give me one second, please. Okay. Um, yep. I can, I can see your browser. So maybe you can put it on in the full screen. All right. Uh, can you see the, the title? Yep. Yeah, it's okay. So I, I pass the time to you first. Thanks. All right. Thank you so much, Patrick. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sandeep um, and I handle the enterprise business uh, at Hasu. And today I'll be talking about uh, using GraphQL to build a, a data access layer for a connected stack. Um, and the, uh, what I'm planning to do is to uh, state the problem and posit uh, an equivalence between a connected stack and a data access layer, uh, what the challenges in such a solution are, uh, and uh, how GraphQL can kind of uh, uh, help solve some of these problems. And I'll also talk about uh, a, a very specific uh, reference uh, architecture for uh, GraphQL um, uh, with respect to how we do it at Hasura. Of course, you're not constrained to do it the same way, but it will serve as a reference uh, architecture or implementation for implementing a, a GraphQL-based uh, data access layer. And uh, then I'll um, leave it up open to questions. All right. So uh, let me begin by uh, trying to first understand what a connected stack is. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I we believe we strongly believe that it's actually a question of managing your different data sources, being able to herd them together, and being able to pro provide a unified uh, data graph to your uh, uh, front-end folks or application developers or even your API consumers, right? Um, and, and, and let's try to understand this problem by looking at, let's say, uh, a shopping cart component in an e-commerce application, right? So uh, when you look at the kind of data that is needed in this component, you have, uh, for a single component, you have sources uh, of data, uh, you have multiple sources of data. For example, you can have product information, uh, various fields like name, description, the image URLs, etc., coming from your uh, product data set. Um, maybe some uh, inventory checks are also happening in the background, um, and, and you have an inventory module sourcing this uh, side of the data. Uh, and, and then maybe your payment information, etc., is coming from your uh, payment service provider, maybe something like a Stripe uh, account. right? So, uh, and, and of course, your order details and whatnot. So multiple data sources for a single component, and uh, you could even have different teams uh, handling each of these different data sources. You could have a, a merchandise team handling the product and inventory, a purchase team uh, managing the capabilities of the order management system, and of course, you have some data coming in from third-party services as well. right? And uh, the way to kind of look at this problem is that you have multiple data sources and depending on your use case you might want to group some of these data sources together in a single component right if you look at it from the point of view of your data requirements you will have uh, different sources different uh, apis exposed by each of these different sources and sometimes you need to club these uh, together right across teams across the actual data sources uh, you may have to let's say pull in information from uh, the marketing uh, cohort, uh, maybe get some information on your buyers, maybe get some order information, product information, and in maybe a, uh, you know uh, on the checkout screen you have a slightly different data requirement, right? Going from the the store screen, um, and uh, when it comes to your supplier screen, you need to string together a different set of uh, data sources. So essentially, uh, across your applications, what you're trying to do is orchestrate your data needs from different data sources, um, and uh, which is why I would like to posit that uh, being able to add efficiencies into your development workflows is actually the problem of providing a uh, seamless data access layer. Right? And, 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 and the challenges to being able to do this, uh, you can for the uh, sake of this discussion, ignore the GraphQL logo in this slide. But uh, when you look at the challenges of being uh, able to provide this kind of a unified data access layer, uh, some of the things that you need to be cognizant of is 
uh, a uh, independence, given the fact that there could be multiple stakeholders who are driving uh, the development of these different data sources, you need to ensure that your unified graph or your data access layer uh, can be iterated upon independently uh, without uh, constant coordination within uh, uh, across teams, which kind of defeats the whole uh, purpose of a microservices or a component-based uh, architecture. Right? Uh, performance and stability uh, are going to be super critical, especially when you provide a, a single endpoint to cater to all your data requirements. Um, and uh, you need to definitely ensure that uh, the uh, the footprint for errors and delays is as low as possible. And, and you need to have a, a good grip on the state of reliability of your endpoint. Right? Um, extensibility is always going to be a concern. Uh, the state of your uh, uh, database models or your uh, data footprint in general is never going to be uh, static. It is always going to be in flux. You should be able to add uh, new sources of data, uh, not just in terms of the kind of data, but also the kind of sources that they're being derived from. For example, if you have a stack that uses a relational database uh, and uh, uh, you want to suddenly throw an elastic search into the mix, you should be able to do that uh, and, and not let that change things in your unified uh, data graph. Then, uh, again, uh, once you bring all these data sources together, uh, authorization, authentication, security are going to be very, very critical to ensure that uh, you can provide perhaps a unified authorization model and a seamless, maybe centralized uh, authentication uh, capability so that each of the microservices or different components in your uh, unified data graph need not authenticate requests individually. And, and these things should be uh, handled at the data access layer itself, right? Uh, there are also some API governance um, uh, requirements that will come in, especially if you have a popular uh, app in out uh, open in the internet, or if you have uh, a public uh, API, uh, you might want to have uh, certain governance features like uh, rate limiting um, and uh, security measures to avoid uh, other forms of denial of service style attacks, and just generally have complete observability into what's going on uh, with your uh, unified uh, data access layer. All right. Uh, so the what I want to talk about next is how uh, 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 you know, this recent technology like uh, GraphQL can help you solve some of these problems. Um, and just to sort of go back to the example that we were looking at uh, about how we have uh, different sources for a, an individual component, I'm going to use the same example to talk about um, what your uh, data access layers goals are. Right? So for example, uh, you, you might want to have a JSON-based endpoint, uh, which caters to any requirement that comes in from uh, the components that you're dealing with on your front end. Uh, you will have uh, information being pulled across multiple sources, as you can see here. Uh, you can have uh, a, a relational graph between the different data sources and have uh, an array of items with nested elements in that. Um, and uh, things being uh, pulled from different data sources, right? Uh, so just let's look at what the basic uh, request response pattern looks like uh, in the case of REST, right? So you can have a simple GET request, which the front end makes to your back end, uh, gets a list of uh, uh, products and their details, right? Um, with a data-driven view, so just to go, kind of go back to this example, right? So you have uh, just the product information coming in from the API. These are basic requests, right? And when you need to kind of pull data from different sources, if you do not provide a, a unified interface for this, what you'll end up doing is make multiple requests. And each of these uh, responses is going to power uh, different subcomponents in your uh, uh, front end component. Okay? And uh, uh, what you need to ensure is that uh, each of these uh, APIs needs to handle, um, uh, you know, the component will need to handle the loading from uh, these multiple API requests, uh, handle the, uh, the error information in each of these different API requests, 
and they need not be uh, standardized. So you will have to deal with uh, whatever pattern the owner of that particular company, uh, data source has implemented. Uh, there's no standardization available. And uh, just like the error, the success state is also something that you might have to uh, play by ear depending on what's been implemented in the API. Right? So it, it, you're not providing a, uh, a streamlined developer experience for your uh, front-end developers and uh, they're pretty much left at the mercy of the authors of the API, right? Um, and in most cases, especially if you don't have data in the format that you have requested, the onus of transforming the data from these different chunks into the in, in, into a format that these uh, that this component can understand is on the front end, right? Uh, the next natural uh, evolution um, is going to be to make a single request, maybe uh, somewhat of a get request with a lot of URL parameters, which can specify exactly what data is required, and the API can send an appropriate JSON response. Right? This is more in line with what the component expects. Uh, the formatting is uh, something that is handled by the API server itself, uh, the transformation, um, the onus of transforming the data is uh, somewhat transferred from the front end to the back end in this case, right? And l let's look at how the uh, how you would evolve, right? So let's say, for example, uh, in, in the previous example, if you were to add a new feature uh, feature for discounts, here's how you would go about it. Uh, the first thing that you may do is uh, uh, work on your database schema and make sure that the uh, your data uh, your uh, Data models can understand what uh, what discounts mean, add the relevant uh, uh, foreign key constraints, etc., with the existing set of tables, which is fairly easy to do. Because once you have a grip on your schema, this should not be too hard, right? And uh, then you will have to uh, set up an endpoint, which can then talk to the database, create a new version of uh, any uh, endpoints that are affected because you've introduced a new field, maybe not too many. Uh, APIs are affected, but if they are, then you need to uh, create new versions of the endpoint so that uh, your clients know that this new version contains information on discounts, and then have your clients iterate on this. Uh, this is not super easy to do. Um, there are uh, lots of reports from uh, GitHub and Stack Overflow talking about how uh, about 50 to 70 percent of uh, uh, develop, uh, development time is spent on this stage trying to uh, fetch information from your data sources, uh, dealing with ORMs, uh, figuring out where uh, how the endpoint needs to evolve, creating different versions, etc. Right, and and this is not super easy, and and of course then you need to document uh, this new iteration on the endpoint, update the docs, uh, fill out all the details about uh, what these uh, uh, what this discount information means in the endpoint, and make sure that the team is uh, aware of this, uh, which is not too hard, but uh, we all know that most devs don't uh, get around to this part. And, and, and then, of course, uh, you kind of update your uh, front-end uh, application, um, which uh, uh, looks at all the different components that are affected by this change, needing to work out what the, the UI and the UX around uh, discounts needs to be. And this is, again, a slightly non-trivial part of the problem. Right? Um, what GraphQL does differently is that, uh, and just a quick uh, segue into the history of GraphQL. It, of course, uh, came from the Facebook stables, uh, especially when they were uh, looking to make a lot of new changes to their new speed uh, um, components uh, for uh, emerging markets. Uh, I believe it was Southeast Asia, uh, uh, Southeast Asian markets, where they wanted to quickly iterate and find uh, product market fit with respect to what they wanted to achieve with the newsfeed component. And that's where they, uh, the genesis of GraphQL lies in being able to uh, come up with a specification using which clients can uh, work with complex interconnected data, request for exactly the kind of data that they're interested in, and get it in a format that actually makes sense for uh, front-end applications. Uh, a little bit of trivia, I believe they were uh, uh, doing this for the React application, um, and uh, the the premise was to improve the developer experience and the uh, uh, improve feature velocities because that's kind of what you need when you want to rapidly iterate on um, 
uh, your feature set to find product market fit, or even uh, subsequently when you want to uh, enhance these uh, features once you've found the fit, right? So then that's the uh, 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 origin story, so to say, for uh, GraphQL. And uh, one of the things that has emerged from this whole uh, adoption of GraphQL and um, uh, you know all the literature on GraphQL, uh, the key insight most organizations that I've spoken to and most organizations that have documented the journeys is that, uh, that their data is very graph-like. Uh, we spoke about uh, the different uh, data sources in the previous set of slides, and we saw that there, there, there are a lot of interconnectedness. Uh, there's a lot of relationship between uh, types in different data sources. Uh, product info, product has inventory levels. Uh, each unit, each SKU in the inventory has a certain uh, pricing uh, information. And when all of this is being presented to the user, you have information coming in from um, you know, third-party uh, APIs as well. And, and, and data in organizations, especially enterprises, is definitely not being used in isolation as, uh, unless it's a very niche use case where you have, let's say, uh, high volume analytics piece that does not talk to any other data and data is just transformed and sent to this particular component. Other than these kind of niche use cases, most data in organizations is very well connected um, and we, the whole premise of, I guess, this entire track is to have a connected stack that can deal with these uh, different sources of data. Right? Um, and, and just to sort of, again, iterate on um, top of uh, uh, the, the graph-based schema design, right? What GraphTool does is it lets you define uh, object types. It lets you, uh, for example, here, uh, I know that there's a field called product, which is of the product type. And a excuse me, uh, each item is a is a product has inventory, and you can similarly have relationships between different uh, object types, which is what a GraphQL schema looks like, right? Uh, and, and and this is pretty much the the standardization in the schema is what uh, powers GraphQL because it offers a a query language for your API, once you have a specification compliant uh, schema, there are client libraries which are capable of um, sending any arbitrary query to this schema and receiving exactly the kind of response that they're interested in. Uh, of course, you can find out more at uh, graphql.org. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to gloss over at a very high level about what GraphQL does and uh, uh, what it means for uh, an API service when we have this kind of uh, mapping, right? Uh, given the fact that it is uh, um, type driven, um, you get a lot of benefits uh, in terms of validation. You get a lot of compile time, development time, uh, um, uh, validations and feedback in terms of whether the request that you're making of your uh, graphical based backend is valid or not. Um, auto correct and auto complete uh, um, uh, auto suggestion features are. Uh, uh, pretty much the uh, the, bare, the bare minimum that you expect from any GraphQL API, thanks to the power of introspection, because the API, the, the introspection API in any GraphQL service will pretty much self-document itself. Uh, it tells you exactly what types are on offer, what the query patterns could look like, and how data relates to each other. Right. So just by conforming to the aforementioned spec you get a uh, completely self-documenting endpoint um, and uh, which uh, lets you provide reads, writes, and real-time connections um, for uh, data processing that your front end can use, right? Uh, so let me just quickly hop on to um, what uh, an example with GraphQL looks like. Uh, very similar to the JSON, uh, the unified JSON request that we looked at, you have a single endpoint, and you can have uh, arbitrary queries based on, of course, your uh, GraphQL schema, and you can request for exactly the kind of data that you need and uh, get that in a format that actually makes sense for your component. And the goal here from a uh, data access layer point of view is that you do the, uh, the aggregation, you do the uh, the relationship mapping, etc., on your GraphQL server uh, uh, end, 
and your client is completely agnostic to the different data sources, etc., that are there beyond your API server, and it can request exactly what it needs and gets exactly that information in response. Right. So now, now let's take a look at what that means for this new feature. Uh, right. When you uh, iterate um, uh, on the feature using GraphQL. So again, we want to introduce this new feature for discounts. Uh, we have a database. You can add a discount table, do the same schema mapping, etc. That you would have had to uh, do with the REST API as well. Um, what you need to do on your GraphQL endpoint is that you don't worry about new endpoints anymore. You the only thing you need to worry about is to make sure that your GraphQL schema is now aware of the fact that there is a new field called discounts or a new type called discounts that is available, and uh, there is no need to version anymore because your schema has just gone uh, uh, through an evolution, and existing requests need not bother about the fact that there is a new field. Uh, only the components that are interested will start making new requests uh, with the discounts uh, type related info. And you really don't need to version anything. You don't change anything in your existing uh, GraphQL endpoint, uh, except for a tiny change to your uh, schema. Uh, there's a little bit of work depending on how you implement your GraphQL schema, but we'll get to that in later slides. And uh, uh, I'm going to gloss over that for now. Um, and then we come to the dissemination of this information, the communication part, uh, and uh, hey, GraphQL is a self-documenting API. So, uh, if, if any of you ever looked at uh, what's called as graphical, uh, you will notice that uh, uh, the explorer and the documentation parts of the API are uh, they come with uh, your uh, uh, GraphQL API itself, and there's nothing you, you need to do. Updating the schema automatically means that your documentation is updated because it is self-documenting. So there's nothing you need to do on this front. And on the application side. Uh, you just need to add a few fields to the affected operations. Uh, a little trivialized here, but there is uh, uh, fewer operations to be done here compared to a REST-like model where your entire response is changing. Uh, you can have components tied to these new fields, and uh, they will take care of itself. All right. Um, I feel like uh, I have... Uh, uh, a lot less time. Um, Patrick, are you there? Uh, yeah, Patrick. yeah, yeah. So I think uh, it's time to wrap up. So um, maybe um, if the, I, I actually can see from the audience that quite some uh, detailed questions. So I will suggest that I will pick maybe one of them. And then uh, for the details, um, Sandeep, you can actually leave uh, your uh, contact email there and then we can uh, let, uh, communicate offline. So I think one one question from the audience, which, which may be in FE developer mind, is that uh, Oh, we do load that GraphQL is good, but uh, we are using a lot of REST API. So uh, is there any common uh, uh, pain point or common recommendation that how the people can migrate from the REST API to GraphQL, maybe a high level one? Yeah. And so that, that's a great question. And this is something that we see uh, come up with a lot of our uh, users and clients as well. Uh, typically, when you're looking at trying to transform your uh, quote unquote legacy APIs to a more modern stack, right? You obviously are not looking at a cut and run kind of approach because uh, no organization typically has the time to pay off technical debt or to modernize the stack itself. So what you could do is you can look at options uh, which let you reuse your REST APIs, front them with GraphQL, and in the back end, you can have a parallel track running to modernize those APIs or make them GraphQL through and through. Right? So, for example, what we do with Hasira is that uh, we have uh, the ability to extend your new GraphQL service by connecting this GraphQL service schema to REST APIs. So, you, and, and these REST APIs can be existing APIs, or, um, you know, SOAP interfaces uh, as well, right? And in in some of the cases, uh, uh, we have had people use uh, controller functions in their MVCs. Uh, they use that, that to delegate some of the business logic and um, have a more longer term plan to modernize that part of the stack so that they can reduce their dependencies on uh, some of these heavier uh, uh, legacy stacks. A uh, little too early to call them legacy just yet, but there are, uh, there are ways to reuse the REST APIs 
front end with graphql make sure that your front end uh, engineers are completely uh, agnostic to the fact that it's a rest call that is an existing rest api is call that is powering this request all they need to care about is the graphql facade in front of them and uh, that gives you the the breathing room to figure out a, a clean migration path from what you have to where you want to get to with graphql yeah, thank you. So, yeah, uh, as I said, I, I saw quite some questions. So, Sandy, I, I suggest that maybe you can uh, share your content, and then if, I believe that many people will be asking more on the GraphQL one. 